based on the ring knowledge. We'll talk more about haters today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guy who thinks who is faster than Hamilton. I'm actually going to go in a slightly different direction for today's episode. I was broke. I had nothing. I came here with the last 10 euros in my pocket. Give us a rundown of what's been going on over the last 12 months. It's been an amazing year. I started the year with 420 or 430,000 subscribers on YouTube. I'm now 1.1. Oh my God, I'm taking over a multi-million euro business. There's a lot that has led up to this. The last six, six weeks, I, I cannot even believe the, the stuff we've been through as a team. What do you think of that? I was having a lot more uh, concerns about the situation that were overtaking the stuff that I was doing. I can put a question back to you. Yes. Like, literally, when the, the situation got worse. Storms quietly raging away, basically, in the background. It's either now, now or never situation. We're actually here yet again. <laughs> Misha, welcome back to Road to Success. We did an episode in the summer together, which did brilliantly on the channel. And since then, we've had literally thousands of requests to basically finish the conversation because it was long anyway, <laughs> but it could have been twice as long uh, and go into detail on many other parts of your life, various stories. People really found the episode brilliant. So this is why I've chosen you as our Christmas special on Aww. Road to Success. Thank you so much. I'm honoured. Now, before we get going, I would just like to say normally the style of episodes I do on the podcast is to talk about how someone has got to where they have done today. If I've had them on for the first time, the story is all about how that person has achieved their success. If you want to see that episode with Misha, it's about six months ago on the channel and you can go and take a look at that. And I'm actually going to go in a slightly different direction and let Misha go in a different direction with today's episode. So, a slight alteration to the first question I normally pose. Misha, in your own words, who are you and what the hell have you been up to in the last 12 months? Who am I? According to the last podcast, I'm the guy who thinks who is faster than Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> Max Verstappen's the go. <laughs> exactly. I should actually ask you, like, so the question one more time again, you asked one lap race, right? Yeah. And I said, based on the ring knowledge, and I explained that, no, no, he thinks he's faster than Hamilton. I think that everyone who's driven at least one or two laps of the Nürburgring is going to be faster than anyone driving for the first time. Anyway, getting sidetracked, we'll talk more about haters today. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> he's already triggered by the comments in the last video. And all we're doing is giving him a platform to come on and basically, I reckon there's a chance here, and I'm already get annoying everyone that told me to shut up last time, but I reckon there's a chance here he's going to get out his phone and go through that comment <laughs> section if we allow him. No, so if, it's if, my if, job to stop that. Exactly. If anything, I want to say this was one of the best thing where people started saying like, oh my God, he thinks he's faster than this because those people would otherwise never share our podcast because they think, eh, whatever. And I'm like, look at this guy, what he's saying. Anyway, let's get back to the intro. Or do you want to redo that? No, that's brilliant. <laughs> We're all good. Well, one of the things that I actually want to talk about, and I think this is a great place to start because we have reference of doing that last podcast together. Yes. And in that time frame, you've actually doubled your mm -hmm. following basis. It's taken years to get to the point that you were at when we were last interviewing you. And now you've doubled it, which mm -hmm. we, we hear a lot on YouTube. There's the snowball effect. When people start, they just they're on a roll and people are showing it to their friends. I think word of mouth actually becomes a huge thing. And I made this little note to say that the last time we saw you, just to give some context, you're on 486K on Instagram. That's now doubled to 900,000 plus. Close to. Yep. Or is it close to 900,000? Mm -hmm. Maybe by the time the episode goes on. No. Uh, and YouTube, you were about 700K just over in August, now 1.1 million. Yes. Which means you've only doubled your channel compared to the fact that we've actually quadrupled Road to Successes following since you were last on. So you need to catch up with the game, really, mate. We have gone from 4,000 to 25,000 subs quite quickly. What do you think of that? Not only that, last time we had an issue of being too hot in the van. You had no aircon. Now we're too cold and you have a heater. So you're up your game, man. That's amazing. <laughs> we're trying to regulate the temperature. And if because we, we've upped our game, all we'd ask before you start listening to us waffle on is that you can hit the subscribe button on this channel because it only helps me get more guests with amazing stories to tell just like Misha and you'd be doing us a massive favor. But should we crack on with it? Give us a rundown of what's been going on over the last 12 months. It's been an amazing year, honestly. I would say I had as you said, one of the successful years ever, well, simply the most successful uh, year when it comes to social media as a content creator. 
I started the year with 420 or 430,000 subscribers on YouTube. I'm now 1.1x something, maybe 1.2 by the time this podcast gets released. As mentioned, close to 900,000. And whereas in the past, I think it took me two years when I started doing YouTube to reach my first 100,000, then one year to do 100,000. And now it's like per month you get 100,000, which is amazing. I think shortly, many people have asked me like, so what's the key to success on that front, especially as a content creator? What have you changed? Well, when it comes to that, YouTube Shorts have helped tremendously. That's what has driven a lot and a lot of subscribers. So when you look at, I don't know, like uh, as a content creator, it's like a very luxury first world problem to have. You look at the short, it has 30 million views and you get like only 1,000 euros of AdSense. Whereas, because when you do it with a big video, you would get probably like, well, tenfold the amount or even like 30 times more. So you're like, hmm, that's little, but you get 50,000 subscribers based on one short alone. And you're like, okay, that is actually very interesting. So that has to do with that, so especially since YouTube has been very actively promoting YouTube shorts, that has helped a lot to grow the channel. But consistency and giving people the type, the same type of content that they're going to expect has helped a lot because in the past I will be posting daily vlogs, what are the best spectator places to do, the top five mistakes on the Nürburgring, blah, blah, blah. It was still the same topic of Nürburgring, but it was a bit of mixed. Now this year I've been posting, I would say 99% onboards only. If there was something else in between, I would of course make a vlog or some public service announcement or something, something my experiences with racing, but focusing on one single thing alone. And that has helped to grow the audience and maintain the audience. So that was absolutely very good, of course. Now, thanks to that, I managed to also gather, I would say, some first world problems that I never expected to have in the last couple of weeks. So we'll get to that later on. So maybe briefly how the year has started. Um, we introduced our first project car in a very long time, I would say, uh, that we wanted to uh, do a giveaway with. And uh, that is something that we're still planning on doing. The problem is <laughs> we built a car. I crashed the car shortly before we were supposed to be giving that away. We did a lap in it. We did a lap in it. I was actually very lucky that I wasn't the person <laughs> in that car. It was actually my good, good man, Joe Achilles, who you've done a podcast imagine, with, was passengering with you. Although imagine the actual views towards you, the same like, I got crashed with you. <laughs> so. But you're still planning on giving that car. I knew we were on the fucking edge. <laughs> he said, no, it's fine. He's there whistling. Yeah, yeah. Down the straight. Um, Road to Success is all about finding out about the history of our guests and how they got to where they are today. Using Car Vertical, you can do exactly the same thing for a car. All you have to do is head over to their website, enter the registration of the vehicle that you're looking at, and their software will run a full report on the car, finding any potential hidden issues. I did one on this BMW M2 that I was looking at and can see that the vehicle's clear on theft has never been stolen. The mileage all checks out and the financial and legal status of the car is A-OK. -okay. However, I was surprised when I saw an amber light next to damage, showing that the vehicle had actually been written off by an insurer in the past, even though it was displayed as A-OK -okay online. This means I now know to steer clear of this car and any potential costly issues that I could incur in the future. If you want to run a report on a vehicle that you're looking at, just head over to Car Vertical and enter the discount code SUCCESS at the bottom for a discount off of your report. Cheers, Car Vertical. So it was a very exciting endeavor because it's a company that actually started together with friends of mine. We'll be developing an app. So it's like a, a side business that I... Um, verged into you would say and uh that was a very exciting endeavor crashed the car as mentioned we rebuilt the car fast forward to now a quick fast forward regarding on that topic uh on the last day when the track was open i wanted to go out for the last lap because the car was rebuilt from the crash i drive to the gas station oil light comes on the engine starts making noise the engine blew up great so now we're not giving the car away again because we need to rebuild the engine. We don't want to be giving it away with broken engine. Oh, shit. It's a very known problem with Toyotas, with the Subaru engines. It's a very known problem. Uh, like, I think the every video I post about this car, I get like tens of comments. Watch out. These people had these issues before and you don't get warranty because it happened on the track. Or you might get warranty if it didn't happen on the track. In my case, it didn't, but I'm a famous influencer who is kind of like showing that I've been driving on track. 
So we can fix it even through the warranty. The problem is we're giving the car away and we want to actually not give someone the car fixed that the issue might come up again. So we're going to reinforce the engine and then actually give it away. So by the time the car is fixed again, we're going to be in a new season and yeah. Um, but that was actually quite an exciting endeavor to actually be sharing these kind of uh, project updates together with the audience to show how the uh, um, how certain mods affect the car, the handling, etc. So that was a very nice side. Of course, the most interesting part was the variety of cars I was able to drive this year. The amount of people that were coming towards me said, so like, hey, you want to drive my car? Ranging from an absolute total shitbox. Uh, that at the beginning of the year, I would say, yes, absolutely. But then I realized, okay, the risks are far higher than the actual potential okay. gains. Uh, I had uh, a case where a coolant hose fell off a car and we spilled coolant over the track. And luckily there were enough marshals and enough photographers to yellow flag the area and no one else crashed over the coolant. But at that point I said, okay, no more old cars. We need to do significantly more thorough with, uh, with the inspections. But yeah, it's been a very great year when it comes to content creation. Now, to go that aside, because a lot of people have seen what I'm doing, have followed me, so they know already the numbers, they know the amount of cars, the, the type of cars we've been driving, the things have, have been going on that are public there. But a lot of things have been happening, of course, behind the scenes. Lots of good things, lots of bad things. And uh, things that I, well, not going to be putting up there because you don't want to be like, focusing on the drama, unless, unless it's something that would potentially affect my audience, I would share that with them. And everyone has problems. Everyone has right to have their own first world problems, but everyone has also problems. And the problems that I was having there in comparison, nothing in comparison to some people going right now in certain parts of the world yeah. with the wars going on with you name it, you know it. So it doesn't feel right to complain yet. I still want to share a couple of things because especially with the last podcast that we did, the last, the only one so far. Um, the part that we were not intending on talking about, the personal part, actually came very hard towards the audience in a very positive way because I shared something personal about my childhood uh, with, I would say, physical abuse with the new husband of my mother, etc., and the relationship and how it went on to that. And a lot of people actually messaged me and uh, they said, Thank you so much for sharing this because I'm going on through the same stage in my life right now. And I was thinking I'm the only one. I'm not allowed to talk about this, uh, that things are not, not going to be uh, not going to be good. But seeing what you're going through and how you made it where you are right now, it gives me hope. It gives me a power to well to continue. This is why I want to bring up a couple of things that have been happening a lot in the background that have been going on while still trying to like balance out the content, the personal life, etc storms quietly raging away basically in the background and it's mad because as you just mentioned as a content creator putting out the same sort of content every week you have to put, bring that big happy smiley face but from someone that I know um, done a significant business deal in my life with selling a company you're actually on the other side of that journey which you're about to talk about so I understand how how stressful <clears throat> sort of a deal to do with a business can be. Absolutely and there's a lot that has led up to this, um, a lot has gone really crazy. I think the last six weeks, uh, you were talking about six months ever since the last podcast, but the last six, six weeks, I, I cannot even believe the, the stuff we've been through as a team, and I will get later on to that more in detail. So one of the things that the year has started in February, the same husband of my mother uh, got diagnosed with cancer. Now, knowing the relationship that I had with him in the past, it didn't do me anything at that point. The only thing that it did to me, I knew what my mom was going to be going through because my biological dad, he died of cancer. And I think we briefly touched on that. Well, not briefly, more in detail on a previous podcast. And seeing someone really vanish in front of your eyes, um, someone that you love, it's really messed up. And even though I not have do not have any personal affection with that person, I do love my mom and I do not wish anything upon her. So the year in general, um, I'll go more later into detail how the last four weeks have affected me uh, on that front. 
the year in general, I was always trying to support my mom because there were, of course, also some financial issues because he was not able to work anymore. She had to work uh, alone. She also had my little brother that she needs to care for. Um, there were lots of things going on, lots of emotional support, financial support, and lots of like questioning in my mind. So um, in general, what I want to say by this, while I'm out there driving the cars on the limit, trying to be happy, etc., in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, oh shit, how's my mom doing? What is happening? What is this? What is that? And it was getting worse and worse and worse throughout the year because the condition was getting worse and, and I'll get to that later on. But this was how the first year already was starting. To, the first part of the year was starting to develop me. So very successful, maybe on content creation side, but already in the background, something happening. Now, another thing, what really affected the decisions that followed, I would say the last three months when it comes to, to the business decisions, you know that I'm engaged to Maggie, uh, the person that I absolutely love with the more than I love myself. And as a YouTuber, I think that says a lot. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, now, on a serious note, uh, I believe uh, we're going to spend the rest of our lives together without all the stuff, uh, without like being all cheesy about it. And you can see that. I mean, today we were, um, we actually came to, as again, you'll get on to, we came to one of your first events today mm -hmm. where we walked around uh, the Nürburgring GP circuit where you did your 12 hour race this year. Yes. And you could just see how easily it was for you two to work together. And it, it shows that having someone supportive by your side can, in most circumstances, definitely be of an aid. Exactly. Uh, she's been my absolute rock. I've been also her support whenever she uh, had her troubles. And I think that's how couples relationships should work in general. Now, the thing is, when you were last time here, our first meeting before the podcast was at the Linder Hotel. That's where she used to work. She was a barkeeper for the last almost three years because she started here just before the COVID hit. So it was like, yeah, what, March 2020? We're now at the end of 23. Um, and I want to say that, and I'm saying to everyone, Lindner, the, the, the bar, the hotel, has the best bar in town. It has amazing atmosphere. It's fantastic. They have great people. Every time I come there, everyone, everyone goes there. It's a fantastic place. However, like every other place in the world, when it comes to uh, the service industry, hotel, bars, etc., when you're a girl behind the bar and you have to deal with certain type of men, it's already difficult. Drunk men, it's more difficult. The English. <laughs> <laughs> and men that come here full of testosterone to drive the track and say, look at me, I'm driving Porsche. And I love Porsche, but sometimes it gets, it gets hard. I try to avoid that place because Every time I would see men hitting on her, I had a couple of times there were like some uh, influencers that would come here to actually do a video with me. I would take him to Linder. We go pay together, and then uh, someone would throw a remark, uh, remark by looking at her as, "Oh my God, I would love to do that girl." And I'm like, "Well, guess what? I'm doing her tonight, and have fun. We're not doing anything together." <laughs> that stuff, you know, it's like this toxic masculinity. But like, come on, have a bit of respect. So. That was annoying because she always has to deal with it. She always do, does it with a smile. Uh, and you, you had that this year. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it, it was like I would say quotation mark an issue over the last three years. Okay. Uh, but but oh, not the last three years. Again, it's not related to the place uh, because it it happens everywhere. I I think everyone who's watching or listening and has worked in the service industry, uh, if you want to see how a person is, take them out for dinner and see how they treat a waiter or a barkeeper. And uh, yeah, then you see how they are towards pe uh, people. What I'm getting at, um, I'm the whole day driving the track. She's having night shift. I'm waiting for her till it's three in the morning because she's coming late home. Then I have like three hours of sleep because I've been working in the meanwhile. I couldn't sleep without her, yada, yada. And then I have like three or four hours of sleep. Next morning, getting up, drive again. And the same thing all over again. So I've been saying already since last year, I mean, like, I'm kind of fortunate enough to say you don't have to work, but she's saying, no, I want to work. So I do not want you to be paying for me because I'm a big independent girl, which I respect and I understand. I probably would be in the same position if someone would tell me, like, here's a million. I'm like, okay, thanks for the million. I'm going to reinvest and do something with it. So the only way I could get her out of it is to actually to try to make her feel like purposeful. So of course I could say like, okay, you can do a couple of emails. Maybe I can teach you how to edit, blah, blah, blah. But after a long time thinking, I decided, okay, let's start 
like an actual new company together. Let's do an ev event agency because you've been in the hospitality industry for the last like, well, 15 years or more because she's been always like working in bars and clubs, etc. Let's use that skill and uh, try to uh, set up some events. Okay, long time talking, eventually convinced to be doing that um, for the sake of helping her, also benefiting maybe myself in a way as a business. Who knows what is going to come out of it? Uh, we made a business plan. I was fortunate enough to sign uh, a contract with the Nürburgring for one of the office spaces at the boulevard. Uh, so at the Nürburgring Boulevard, I got the like one of the office spaces, including the parking, and that's where we would set up our company from. Now, I signed for the contract, and as I'm walking out, all happy, and we were supposed to have a notary appointment year after to actually establish our company, and then later like to set up the bank account, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I get a message from Robert, the co-founder of Apex, and he's like, "Well." You probably have heard that we are stopping doing rentals this year because, um, again, Apex is uh, it's known for having a hotel, having rentals. We used to do rank, a ring taxi before. And now we'll be stopping uh, rentals. So I'm kind of like considering multiple options how to proceed with the business. And that went from, well, keeping it as is to downscaling to selling it completely. But the main question mark was I do not want to sell it to just anyone because, well, I don't want to. I like uh, so like that would that's kind of option is kind of off the table, to which I'm looking like, huh, well, great. So I said for a joke, well, you know what? If if we're gonna be in the same position in like one or two years, we can do it. He's like, you know what? Let's talk about it and maybe let's do it right now. So here am I signed the contract for the Nürburgring office and already with plans having like this new event company, and then I get this offer that like, well, that could be interesting. And just for a little bit of um, context for people, you've worked with Apex for years, worked with Robert for years, mm -hmm. appeared in a lot of your content. Also, you've appeared in pieces of content for Robert and for Apex. And a lot of people have you as the face of Apex in yeah. their heads when they think about it. But you actually never owned any of Apex during yeah. that journey. You were, you were the face of the brand and the ambassador mm -hmm. of the brand without a shareholding, which is why when the actual shareholder, the owner Robert, was thinking of selling he messaged you. And there's a lots of emotional value behind it because, so the first time when I came, well, the second time when I came to the Nürburgring, because in the first podcast, again, for everyone who wants to hear the backstory, they should go and to listen to that. I was broke in a massive minus uh, after leaving or being actually left by the previous employer um, in Russia and thinking like, okay, what am I going to do with my life? Well, I'm going to come back to Nürburgring and long story short, uh, I got this kind of offer from Robert to come and work together with him and start this new business of Apex. One of my uh, terms and conditions were the first three months you pay me in advance. And because, and the reason for that, I told him like, well, because I've been screwed over and I want to be doing work for people for nothing. In reality was I was broke. I had nothing. I came here with the last 10 euros in my pocket. And I remember we drove to Ventisette because, well, he picked me up from the airport. We went to have some lunch first. Then we we looked at Apex, which was like a, a complete disaster back then because we, we did lots of renovations. But before that, it was like an old German house. And then we went for dinner. And then I'm like standing in the air, like thinking like, God, he needs to give me cash that he would, he promised me. And then eventually he gave me like my first month and also the first month rent. And like, whew, I'm safe. But basically everything that has led to this, I do owe to him. Like, because he gave me the chance, he's been always good to me, also when I was being bad. Uh, he really, like, thanks to him, I'm at this point, thanks to him, I am where I am right now. Uh, I'm not going to say that without him I wouldn't have been, because maybe there would have been better, but definitely there probably could have, would have been worse opportunities, maybe it would have taken me shorter time to get where I am right now, or maybe longer, who knows. Uh, but we are where we are, and he has contributed a lot to my success, especially in the beginning. And... Going from a broke guy with a suitcase in the airport with the last 10 euros in his pocket, thinking like, oh my God, I hope I can survive, I can pay up my debts, to I can now buy this multi-million euro business that I helped to build over the last seven to eight years. And that was quite, you know, like, holy shit. That's cool. quite, it's cool, but it's like, 
profound. Yeah, like are we really talking about this? Is this like, uh, like is this like okay? So we had uh, some discussions. We, we we did some numbers, and I said, yeah, okay, we can do this. Uh, also was from his side, and we started working towards the deal. Now before that, as mentioned, the decision was already made together with the team by saying like we're not going to be doing rental cars anymore. Obviously, with having this big chunk of the business go away, this means that people will either have to do something else, or if they don't want to, they have to go look for something else because they've been doing that. Um, now, some people went and looked for something else. And when we introduced to them, like, okay, actually, I will be taking over, and my idea is to do something else with the company, um, <clears throat> Diana and Marta, so two of the people, they said, okay, we're going to stay. So they didn't look for any alternative options. So at that point, all right, great. We started making crunching business plans, making like what we will be doing, approaching people, approaching companies. Now, I rem and the thing is, it's all going out, uh, going on in the back of my mind. It's constantly, every single day, because I wake up and like thinking, holy shit. This is happening. We're going for it. How are we going to make this work? Because I went in like a couple of days from like, hmm, we're going to set up a company. We might do a track day. We might do a track walk together with my future wife and la, 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 la. And we see how it goes to, oh my God, I'm taking over a multi-million euro business. I'm going to have additional three people of staff. We're going to have lots of overhead expenses. How the hell am I going to get the well money together this and there and there? And aside, I have also family issues. And aside, I have some other things going on while I'm driving a race. And like, I remember literally driving the race. And as I'm going to corners, I'm just zoned out and I'm thinking, I'm starting counting like, okay, this, 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 this. And this is why, of course, I was like underperforming in a lot of things, especially under stress, because I was like really with when I'm driving with, and you can see it very clearly when I'm driving with someone else as uh, like, any regular video on YouTube, I get, well, entertained, I talk with the people, I drive, we're having fun, la, 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 la. Whistle. Exactly, whistle. When I'm driving a race, I need to be focused, but me, as you can tell by the podcast, a bit of ADHD person, I kind of zone out and I'm like, okay, this, 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 I start thinking, and the performance just goes to absolutely zero when it comes to driving. You start making mistakes, and especially the, as the year progressed, and the personal situation back home with my mom and her husband got worsened, I was having a lot more uh, concerns about the situation that were overtaking the stuff that I was doing. Now, before I'm gonna go into that, another important thing that uh, I want to mention that was actually really uh, like affecting the decision is last year I did uh, a lab with student, uh, engineer student uh, with an Opel Speedster. And he built a car that had uh, him uh, designed aero kit by himself. It had only splitter, side skirts, underbody, and the diffuser. It had no wing. Yet the car was generating so much downforce that it was sucking itself to the ground and you could not drive on top speed because it was just like flattening the suspension. And I was blown away. The whole audience was blown away. That video by now has, I think, over 2 million views. And all the comments were like, Oh my God, this guy needs to get a job at Formula One. Now, because, and in that video, he's like, oh, I'm looking for an internship because I'm a student. He got his internship. He got a job offer at Ferrari. He's been working at Ferrari uh, as a designer. I'm not allowed to tell you what he's been designing because we will get killed, both of us probably. Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, but he's been very successful. And actually from that video on, back then already I told him, if you want to do something and you should, I want to help you with that. Like, and back then I was not thinking about being an investor or a business owner or whatever, because I was still like significantly smaller YouTuber or content creator back then. I was still happy just to be doing stuff that I was doing. But I said, this is cool. You're humble. You have your head on the right place. Let's do it. Now, fast forward to this year. He, we both agreed we need to do this now because it's either now, now or never situation. And he actually announced his resignation with Ferrari. They offered him like a very good contract and said, no guys, I want to do something of my own. Although I have fantastic position now on the stuff that I'm doing here, but I want to do what I'm doing now. So the idea was to start this business together. And since the talks of taking over Apex were taking place, we were thinking, okay, we can place it there. 
like we can have our workshop there since the rentals are not going to be going on. So the business that we want to, to do and that we will be doing, I'll get more in detail later on, is to create an engineering firm. We'll be creating a custom engineering solution with 3D scanning, 3D printing of aerodynamic parts, car lots of carbon fiber manufacturing, lots of custom solutions for customers. Starting small, going big, and eventually we'll see what will end. So having Apex, that would be a, a perfect foundation already not to have to worry about having a workshop. Um, and yes. But but why? This is one little question that went through my mind there, which is you mentioned before, there's a lot going back on at home. And then you wrote, reeled off everything that you've currently been doing this year and getting up to. You've got a business deal here. Mm -hmm. You're sat in that car trying to drive it. You didn't even mention the fact that in the background you were creating content a yeah. minute ago when you reeled off all of those things. Mm -hmm. Are you? Do you always do the next project just because that's the way your brain's currently working? Or are you doing that next project to take your mind off of the stuff that's really going on in the background? There are lots of reasons, and it's hard to answer them. I think in case of this engineering project uh, that I took on, it was something that we were talking already a lot about and we wanted to do, and this, this, this felt like a right thing to do. When it comes to... The event business I wanted to set up together with Maggie, uh, it was something that I wanted to improve our situation at home. So we both will not be suffering from having, well, living two different lives and then meeting at home at a certain place. And when I got this, uh, like the question request or message from Robert about, well, Apex, I don't know, like uh, I'm considering, like uh, I have a couple of options. My first reaction was like, Oh my God, cool, I could do that after we talked more about it. But the main thing, which was later the problem that I realized, the reason why I did this, is that I have emotional attachment to the company that I have built over the last seven years. And the last thing I want to happen is indeed some random guy come up, buy it, and make it some, I don't know, whatever business it is, and we'll be looking back at it and like, well, that's kind of shit. Like, you know, someone ruined it. And at the same time, also Robert said he doesn't want to sell to a random person because... He doesn't want it to go away. And he's fortunate enough to needing the money for it. So, and actually, the funny thing is, when uh, the talks were being more progressive, when we would be talking more already to existing companies to have them on board as partners, the, the news got out among the locals that I would be taking over. And of course, he would get the lots of offers from other people randomly oh, wow. or directly, like, I want to buy this and I have more money than Misha and na 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 na. But they've been simply ignored. <laughs> so in short, this has proven the fact that there was no necessity to sell because um, actually like, uh, wait. So this has proven the fact that there's no necessity to sell out of monetary reasons, because aside from people making offers, like the Nürburgring life, uh, people start making rumors. Oh, uh, Robert is in financial trouble. Also, the, the funny thing is like in 2017, I remember his McLaren, two Mc, uh, no, one McLaren got picked up for service because the, the car just needed service. And local gossip was like, yeah, it got impounded because it didn't get picked up on a local, like a normal truck, but like uh, like on a McLaren truck. So people love to make drama and that's fantastic. Uh, so people started saying, okay, he has financial problem or he is sick because he lost so many kilos because he actually improved his life. He's become a lot more fit, more active. And the reason why he was considering selling it is to actually to spend more time with his family. That's what he's been doing the last two years a lot. And a lot of people have been asked, why is Robert not on your channels? Why is he not making videos? Is because he has priorities straight, like very straight and right. He wants to spend time, see his kids grow up and spend time with his wife. And that is amazing. And I hope I will be fortunate enough in the future to actually say that like, you know, guys, I don't care about content. I don't care about this. I want to spend time with my family. And that's something that I've actually been working towards a lot. That's why a lot of these decisions have been happening because I want to be more together with my loved one. Uh, yeah, where were we now? <laughs> where are we now in the <laughs> timeline? So um, the thing is, again, um, let me give a Give it a thought right, we can, because that's we can like, chill in the edit. This like very long uh, train of thought that we ended up here where we are right now. <clears throat> um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. So. <sighs> 
I can put a question back to you. Yes. Good. Robert actually said, because you just put out a video before this has got live, and he mm-hmm. actually went into um, detail about, and it was it was profound because you could actually see, obviously, where it was a video, you were looking at him, you're like, whoa, he's lost so much weight. That is insane. Yeah. And he put that video out, and it shows that that really does matter to him. And to be fair, that's something that I'm trying to work on at the minute. <laughs> but understanding, and I'm actually talking to my PT about that it's really difficult to do that when you're trying to spin eight plates. Sometimes that is the thing that tips you over the edge. So, you know, kudos to him for actually getting his head down and getting it sorted. Exactly. And that's speaking of that video, one of the things that he said back then uh, in the video and also to me personally, he said, Misha, slow down. Don't try to do so many things at the same time. And this is uh, what actually also has happened because while we are getting closer to finalize the deal, we're talking to all the partners, we're making all these uh, ideas to host events at Apex, through Apex, have this workshop, this engineering company, and a couple of more things. Um, The situation at home is getting worse to the extent that my mom's husband is about to die. Uh, like literally when the, the situation got worse in the last like couple of weeks significantly uh, like people who have been dealing with cancer they know how it goes you're fine and then in the next like literally within a week you're passing away now again going back to the fact that I did not uh, have any good relationship with him and I want to again elaborate for the sake of before people start saying it's not that I'm defending myself against haters but Again, I'm not wishing anyone to die, but in this case, it wouldn't do anything to me. Why is that? So first of all, when I was uh, 11 years old, we moved to the Netherlands uh, together with my mom. She got married before it was all fine and dandy. Once she actually married him, it turned out he was quite an alcoholic abuser. Then the cherry on the icing a year later, or within a year later, uh, I come home from uh, primary school And my mom was sitting on the couch in tears and she said, tomorrow we're getting evicted. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, well, apparently uh, that guy was trying to impress her so much that he decided to buy certain things, but not to pay for the rent. So uh, the following day I come home from school and I see uh, like people just literally just throwing stuff out of our house outside. You were 11 years old. I was at the time probably 12, but probably 11. Yes. That's going to have a profound effect on you. Exactly. So this thing stayed with me. Mind you, my mom was pregnant with with my little brother at the time, with his or and, and her son together. And this is something that happens while she's pregnant. And I'm going to spare you the details, but um, we were homeless. I got to live at my primary school's uh, uh, friend's place because it was time when the primary school exams were taking place. I had to do my test that would determine literally my future. And you get to do a test, you can score maximum 550 points. I scored 541. So uh, it allowed me to go into like the highest high school uh, VVO, it's called in, uh, in, in Netherlands, that would allow me to go to university. And the funny thing is when we went to actually go to the high school, the dean said, well, we can put you in the highest, great. But since you've been only like a year and a half in the Netherlands, I don't want to be the guy who made the choice to put you the highest. And you're going to have the issues with Dutch language course. And then you're going to have bad grades there. And then I'm the one who put you there. So we're going to put you in a lower one, like two degrees lower. And if you perform well, you can go like go still on a higher on the second year. Long story short, I was getting higher grades in Dutch than the Dutch kids <laughs> because that pissed me off so You're much. You're quite an academic then. Um, in a way. I mean, Because some people I get on, because I interview a breadth of different people. Yes. You've got everyone from Del Boy yeah. to academic and mm. it's different how people have achieved um, their successes. <clears throat> but definitely you didn't expect when you were doing that that you would end up Indeed, creating exactly. content in a car at the Nürburgring. I always wanted to be a history teacher. I'm a history geek. Uh, only a few of the Instagram pages I follow are about history and history memes. Uh, and I always said I, I wanted to be actually a history teacher or a professor. So uh, who knows, one day maybe I get to do a lecture or something. Or we get to do a history channel on YouTube, who knows. But going back to all of this, the reason why I said it, the second most crazy thing that happened 
So later on, two years later, my mom had an accident because she was cycling to her job and she got hit by a car at 80 kilometers per hour, which is like, what, uh, 50 miles per hour? She barely survived. Uh, she broke her, uh, what's this called? Collarbone. collarbone. Uh, she broke her leg so she could not walk. Uh, it was very horrible, very bad. Uh, she, uh, she had a baby already at the time. Yet still, she would be try to help around the house because I was in school. He was working kind of in a way, and she would still cook for him. But the mister would fall drunk asleep on the couch, and then when he would wake up, she, he would get angry because he's watching football, so to call. And then he would go to dinner one night, and he would get mad at her because the consistency of potatoes was not good enough. And at that point, so she was sitting in a wheelchair. She got up because he went to bed. She ran after him with her broken leg. <clears throat> and he started to slam the door against her broken leg and hit her. I was 13 at the time to which I lost my shit for the first time to him. And I told him, stop or I'm gonna kill you. To which he said, you fucking monkey, shut your mouth or you're going back to Russia. So again, going back to the beginning of the podcast, I want to tell everyone who's going through the similar situation, things will go get better. And at the same time, to elaborate why I could not give a flying fuck what would happen to that person who was dying. But I was caring because my mom was caring. She was worrying about him. She had financial burdens of the medical care and everything. And over the last couple of weeks, when the situation was getting worsened uh, and his liver would uh, completely like stop functioning, he would get delusional. He would start like seeing people that were not there, seeing demons that were not there. Uh, he would attack a pillow with scissors because he was thinking something was attacking him, but it was not. So here am I sitting and thinking like, what if he attacks her? What if he kills her in her sleep or alive because he considers that something is like that is happening? So, and here am I making content, happy, having this deal in the back of my mind happening. I remember like by now, during the recording of the podcast, we had like an event with Bilstein, like the race team, uh, the suspension manufacturer I'm representing this year as uh, as a race car driver together with uh, Jimmy and Steve. Uh, we had a sim racing event and I get on the, I'm, I'm supposed to drive my stint on the sim and I'm driving and I'm getting like a message from my mom. I see it on my, on my watch, please call me. And I'm like, shit, we're doing this like, PR event where I'm supposed to be driving. I crash seven types in one lap because I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I'm thinking with my head, like, fuck, 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 fuck. Like literally, like, what what the hell happened? So then eventually, finally, like Maggie came to me and she, I said, get someone to sit on that sim rig. I cannot, I need to call my mom. Things were getting worse. Um, indeed, luckily it was not as bad as I hoped or like uh, as I was feared. Um, it was um but these things were like constantly going through my mind. And at the same time, like I said, the deal of Apex was happening while I was still like making content and et cetera. So we, yes. Can I just ask yes. what, why many people may be thinking, did you ever tell, ask your mum why she stayed with this man? Or did you ever try and tell your mum to leave? Or did you very much leave that up to her? I'd imagine if you got put in a position that, that awful, that surely you'd be saying, mom, you've got, you've got to lead this. I mean, so here's the funny story. Um, up until a certain point, she was always scared to be left alone to actually having, uh, well, being thrown out on the street again, because she had no one, uh, because at the beginning, of course, we were dependent on being with him because we came from Russia. We had no Dutch citizenship. So if you like all of a sudden get a divorce, okay. then you have a problem. Had a I, hold on her. Yes. And I do believe that she was loving him. Like, of course, because they had a kid together and we can talk maybe about Stockholm syndrome. I don't know, because we already mentioned the previous time how I actually 
got away from the house because another time when he actually tried, well, actually beat me and her when I was 18 at the time, no, I was slightly older than that. Then I'm like, okay, that's enough. Now you're mine, bro. Because, well, <laughs> I can't. Sorry. You, you know, I can. It's been enough, simply. And when I left, and <laughs> miraculous thing what happened because she actually more or less kicked me out of the house saying like, you're the violent one. I'm like, sorry, what? I'm the violent one. So of course I went away and every contact that she tried to make with me, I would ignore. And I would tell her, you're not my mom anymore because you're literally choosing the side of an abuser instead of your own son. So I'm sorry, I'm done. Like, don't talk to me. And what happened then, she came to realization and she actually dropped divorce papers on the, on the table and saying like, well, that's enough, I'm leaving you. And since that moment, he's been fluffy as a pussycat. Called his bluff. Yes. So. We, I understand it, where you are at today. So, uh, yeah. So as of, as of today, are we now saying that he, he passed away back in the summer? Uh, well, he passed away actually uh, in the week that we were supposed to do the announcement of me taking over Apex. We actually filmed the video already doing the announcement, uh, saying like, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. This is what's going to happen next. Told a lot of your friends. You A lot of my friends. Told me. I told you. Got very excited and I was like, told, yes, yes, Misha, I can't wait to do the second podcast with the announcement that you bought Apex. Exactly. Told a lots of business professionals in the car industry, leading people, leading executives of car brands that we would be working together, doing exciting things together. And... As all of this happening, I was literally burnt out. I was trained. So then he passed away in a week that we were supposed to do the announcement. We had to organize the funeral, of course. And uh, um, Did you go? Yes, but only because my mom asked me. And I went there to support her and, of course, also my brother. And I was there and, yeah, okay. Like, then for the rest, we... Uh, uh, I want to say a big thank you to Diana that has been working at Apex and is working with me now for actually going to support my mom because while everything was happening here, uh, she went there to help her out with like all the reorganization of the house, with the funeral service, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's something that she helped me out with a lot as well. And um, yeah, the thing is why I'm mentioning all of this, all of that is happening. And even though I had... <laughs> not so good relationship with him and it couldn't do anything to me when someone is passing away. And especially in, this was like the kind of ending point, it kind of makes you think about life. Like, you know, what is important? What are you doing? What you're doing uh, is what you're doing. Right. And that was the point. Okay. Hey, I'm emotionally drained and I think it's time to reflect what we'll be doing in the future. And is it right? What we're doing. And as we, mentioned in the video together with Robert, we wanted, we had the means to make the, the deal happen, but also both of us kind of had our old backs who were like, that we both together decided not to do it. Now, he will talk probably about his reasons in the future or on his channel or whatnot. For my side, I realized that the reason why I wanted to take over Apex in the first place, as I kind of alluded into it and mentioned it, it was the emotional attachment to the brand. I didn't want to go it. And this excitement, like, oh my God, I can actually afford this. Let's fucking go. So before anyone gets in the comments and blazes, oh, it's because Robert asked Misha for just too much money and it was way more money than Apex was worth because Misha's got over a million subscribers now and he's raking it over the videos. It was nothing to do with that. It had nothing to do with financials. As a matter of fact, of course, people are going to be talking about I would actually be thinking that would they say that I did not have enough money or did not raise enough capital. And at this point, I would say like, well, the only thing that matters is I pay all my bills in time and well, I get to do what I do. So I don't owe anyone any financial explanation. So the, the possibility was there. And for everything else, of course, people are going to talk. And great, please talk because I am where I am right now because people talk for the good or for the bad. <laughs> well, 98.8% last time was for the good. but <laughs> Exactly. So... Like I said, the reason I realized it's for me personally, I didn't. So first of all, like I said, the the first reason to actually go with the deal was for the wrong reasons. 
I would say the the emotional uh, reason because oh I don't want the, the the brand to fall into wrong hands, and then especially later as we started talking that Robert actually wants to do more videos back go into YouTube game, but actually do not have the need to do it, but do it because he loves to, because he wants to educate his kids and show this educational process to with, with the audience. So I'm like, okay, you know what? The brand is going to be all right. This is great. But another thing that also set me back is I was thinking, if it is going to be good later, if I'll be successful, people will be saying like, oh, it's only because Robert built it and he took it over and there's like no success owed to him for what he's done. Or maybe it's going to be bad. And people are going to be saying like, well, thanks, Misha, for ruining one of the best brands at the Nürburgring. And we sat together also and we talked a lot. And Robert actually asked me, asked me like, do you need this? Like what you want to be doing? And I'm like, you know what? Well, actually, definitely not because I already was planning to do an event agency. I was planning on doing the engineering company together with Lapo, this engineering student. I already had my goal set on that. And Apex is is a great brand, it's a fantastic location, but we built it from zero. And I think we'll be taking a lot more pride into building something from the ground up and being more proud of what it will become eventually. There's something incredibly tangible there where it's like Apex was a dangling carrot in front of you at a time where you thought you had most of it all figured out and you had direction because a lot of people that I speak to from sitting on the other side of this desk and speaking to content creators from around the world, from Freddie and his P1 to guys that film cars leave events to guys with their own events companies to all sorts, is the ones that do actually seem to... Uh, have long-term sustainable income or less stress are the ones that build businesses around their brand. The guys that just try and build their brand do end up struggling. Eventually the content becomes unwanted, unseen. Obviously at the minute there's a huge craze around rebuilding crash damaged supercars, whether mm -hmm. that's going to last or not. I have my doubts long-term and it's, it's what, how these guys and how yourself as well can actually develop a business around mm -hmm. their own brand rather mm -hmm. than just having a YouTube channel for the mm -hmm. rest of your career that could suddenly just be gone overnight. Yeah. So that is what you're going to be doing. Yeah, exactly. And uh, to go more in detail on that, I think I said in the last podcast already, I do want to be doing what I'm doing right now for the rest of my life. I mean, Maggie is every day she's scared to death that something is going to happen to me on the track because shortly after we shot our first podcast, we saw two people literally die in front of our eyes when the two test engineers had a tire blow, blow out and they well, got killed in an accident. And that's something ever since she does not want to go on track. So I don't want to go. Wow. So you filmed your episode with taking Maggie out before that happened. With the Lamborghini timeline. or what? Yeah, I saw that. No, that, that happened after. Okay. So with her being this scared, it, it has to do with the fact that she does not trust, she's not feeling comfortable in the track or fast cars. And that's... Yeah. Do you still feel as comfortable in the track and fast cars? <laughs> yes, but I do get conscious about this, like more conscious that things might happen, especially as more and more things happen, as more and more cars I drive, brakes fail. And it's of course great for YouTube, like, oh, we saved it all oh, last moment, oh, brake fails and great for, for content. But at one point is going to be go horribly wrong, probably. When you jump in that many cars, because I, I've always tried to get ahead with the episodes that I film in this van, but talking about your content creation uh, after our episode before, you actually told me that you had 186 episodes, I think it was filmed, yeah. ready to go out over the winter season yes. when the ring closes. Yeah. And I was like, I'm two podcasts ahead right now. <laughs> How this guy is like a machine. But that meant that if 99% of your content is jumping in mm -hmm. other people's cars that you're offered to drive around one of the most technically challenging racetracks in the world, if not the world... How long do you spend actually looking at a car in the car park before you go out in it to make sure it's not going to kill you? Or do you, do you end up being a little bit complacent? I mean, I do look at the basics. I look at the brake pads, the size of it, the everything. But there's only so much you can look at, especially at by looking at the car. Even the things, let's suppose, again, I mentioned that uh, one of the cars I drove, a, a, it leaked coolant. But the coolant 
hose popped off the one from the backside of the engine that actually connects the, the heater with the engine. So no way I would be able to see it even on the lift on the detailed uh, inspection. And there are things such as like electronical failures that sometimes happen. Things happen like that. Even again, with the race car that we are driving, completely built race car professionally, it started as a production car. So sometimes the car decides like, you know what? I'm going to turn on traction control mid-lap. <laughs> and then you're coming in, the car goes full on the brakes in the corner and you end up in close to a wall. With a fully built race car. Converted race car. Yeah, it, professional car. And that's a production spec issue. So there's always going to be happen something when you especially least expect it. the unknown, yeah. Exactly. So... <sighs> Of, of course, there is a big gap or there is a big difference between actually going on in a single car or actually reducing your risk and saying like, you know what, I'm not going to go out during a public session or track this. I'm going to stick to racing only when I'm a full racing gear, et cetera, et cetera. But we're, yeah, we're doing stuff we're doing because we either love them or we are adrenaline junkies or for whichever reason. And for me, it's a combination of multiple factors. But would you say that even though your following has grown the most this year, would you also say your want or desire to move away from that has also grown this year? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, by now I'm, uh, I've am i started a second YouTube channel. Well, I am starting. I filmed already a couple of videos to post there because I want to be posting vlogs again to not to alienate the first audience and to actually do exciting stuff. And the same goes for the reason why I'm starting those businesses at this point because I do not want to be dependent on YouTube all the time and going through the same thing because at this point there is little challenge for me in the way of today is I need to post a video I haven't posted yet I'm going to wait till five in the evening go through my daily routine and now upload all the stuff into the timeline edit it within two hours I have the video uploaded posted together with thumbnail and all the other social networks all by myself and it becomes a boring routine in a way as a content creator. There are no challenges. There's a quote that I heard uh, recently on another podcast, and it is, the magic you are looking for is in the work that you're avoiding. Yeah. And I actually thought that's quite profound here because it took you a little while to think about go doing this new business with your other half. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I could already see from attending the first event today on track that there's so much passion, there's so much spark, there's so much, as you can see, you're brilliant at speaking on this podcast, willingness to show people things, corners, information, knowledge, like an encyclopedia, history, yeah. as you mentioned before. So do you definitely think that you're finding that magic already after today's experience? Absolutely. And just going back to the, the finish of the cancellation of Apex deal, if we, we should refer to that, the thing back then, okay, although... We both agreed to not to do this, and we. I want to highlight we're on very good terms because we made a video together. We're both we're still wearing Apex merch right now, wearing Remot merch because that's uh, the ugly Merry sweater uh, that I have. Indeed, we're on very good terms. We. I'm looking actually to be honest. I'm very looking forward to the stuff that Robert might end up doing here by actually spending more time with the family and not having the stress of having the rental cars all around, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, making more content. We'll be doing more content together. He'll be joining our, our events again. He was there today with his family. And that's, again, that shows that everyone who wants to start gossips or some bullshit, please don't. Although it will give us more, yeah, uh, what's it called? Relevance in the world because people will be talking about this. But there's no bad blood. It's all great. Um, but one of the important things that happened then, because two of the people at Apex, Marta and Diana, uh, they said, okay, even though that you're taking over, we want to stay with you. Even though we knew that Apex is going to scale down, we're not going to look for another job or say no to a couple of offers that came in. We're going to stay with you. Then I have also Lapo who said, bye-bye Ferrari, I'm going to start my own business. And here am I, like one of the last moment together with Robert, like, ah, you know what, let's not do this because we have our like completely, like our personal reasons not to do it. But I have three people who decided to change their lives well, actually four, because Maggie also quit her job at the hotel uh, to, to do something with me. And I'm like, well, now I still have actually four people that I'm responsible for who decided to change their lives for my sake. And that's something I owe to them to, for their trust. And we still need to do something together. So decision was made that together with Maggie, Marta and Diana, we're going to start this event company. 
we will be doing events. Uh, so one of the first things was this winter track walk. Even though in the beginning we wanted to do it under the name of Apex, now we're doing it under the name of our new company. Uh, we'll be doing this. Uh, we have this office at the Nürburgring Boulevard that we'll be using for our future activities that have been already that has been sitting empty since like before August. I already got it when, when I signed for it. <laughs> so now we're actually going to go to IKEA and make a vlog about buying furniture and all those stupid puns about IKEA product God, names. God, man, you have got soft, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Um, but yeah, so. Um, we started the company, uh, and they are actually becoming a part owners of that company. So it's not that I'm just employing them. They're actually becoming, becoming shareholders in that company as a big thank so you. you all them. have an interest. Exactly. We'll all have an interest and the things that these girls right now have really put on their feet by, uh, even though not knowing like or having experience or have not having experience in certain things when it comes to setting up a business, it's amazing. So, and after today's event, like you said, I was looking there and thinking like, holy shit, we have a fantastic team. We're going to kick. Uh, and that's what's so good actually about, and it, it gives me great enjoyment in having this van as a studio because we're out here. It only took us seven and a half hours to be fair this time from the mm -hmm. UK to bring the studio to you. But I actually get to see that before we sit down and record. Mm -hmm. So I, un I understand what you mean. So we came with you today. We came here, feel it. We sat at dinner with all the guys that you've just mentioned. You can see their relationship together and it does actually help as much as I try, I'm trying to get it across to the audience that mm -hmm. you see that stuff. You're not just talking about it. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a verification check. Yeah. That what you're saying is the, these guys do really click. Yes, exactly. And that was fantastic. You know, it, it's in the grand scheme of things, this was just like a relatively small event. We had 50 people in, in total. Uh, a pilot. Uh, yeah. A, a small part of them were just like friends and family that we invited that we wanted to share this experience with us. So actually friends and family would be the critical ones who can tell us like, you know what, this actually sucked. And this is why I'm telling you as a friend or family. Um, but so far everyone enjoyed and loved it. And to see this all come together was really like, okay, this is amazing. We're now hungry for more. And by saying this, we also want to really expand beyond the Nürburgring because we've been all here for many, many years. I actually, even though I applied for a track day, uh, for a track day date, I unfortunately didn't get one here at the Nürburgring, but we are already working to do more stuff on other tracks and even outside of Europe. And that's something that I would be very much looking forward to doing. And actually something that you, I think, will be doing next year. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say about that, <laughs> but you will probably mention more on the 1st of January. Um, yeah, so it's been fantastic. And also when it comes to this engineering business with Lapo that we will start together on the 1st of January, uh, even though he's come, he's moving in here at the end of January, and we actually have our uh, workshop already ready. We signed the contract, we put the down payment and everything. The company has been already established. And what I'll do, just I'll do as a favor to you, I'll leave the link to the drive that you did with him in the description blocks below, yes. just if people would like to go back and see that first drive. Yes. Exactly. You should definitely go have a look and probably maybe I'll put up the second video that we shot together with his updated Opal Speedster with Out DRS. Of one of the 180 that he's got on his back burner. Uh, um, nowadays, probably just 110. <laughs> oh, just 110. <laughs> so what is the name that you've chosen for your new company? Ooh, yes. <laughs> well, officially I wanted to announce it only on the 1st of January, but uh, since you traveled all the way here, I might as well give you a, an exclusive. <laughs> For people who made it this far, give us the, the fucking exclusive. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. I know we said. I know we said we have more time and we bought more batteries, but fucking hell, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, so for the event agency, uh, we kept it simple. It's going to be called Three MD because the 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 first letters of the four founders or the first three as like Misha, Marta, Maggie. So Three M and D is Diana. So Three MD. GmbH, GmbH or LLC, you know? Sure. So simple because it's going to be, yeah, it doesn't need to have any name because uh, of course it needs to have a name as a, from a company perspective, but many of the events will be just organized from my name and it will be like, hey, track walk with Misha or track day with Misha or uh, I don't know, some festival with a name around it. It's more of a just name name. But I think the more interesting that you want to know is the engineering company name 
or is there another question you wanted to ask? No, I, I was going to ask, and this is good because for your uh, audience, the 1.1 million of them mm -hmm. um, that you've built up on YouTube, this actually starts to give them an opportunity because I see the people when I come here that want to speak to you mm -hmm. that interrupt your dinner sometimes to take selfies <laughs> with you. Um, and many more and how people got when I last came at Apex and I see those people and I but that you're actually going to have more opportunities for them to actually come and interact with you rather mm -hmm. than just being on a screen as well through the new company yeah for sure I mean first and foremost uh, you see it also quite often in my video I'm filming an intro I'm walking around the car and someone randomly just stops in the middle of the road like oh my god Misha is this you I want to and I'm like oh, yeah sure let's take a picture I, I drop everything I'm doing and I'm giving them a piece of my time while I'm actually well making content because and it doesn't matter where it is, who it is. I always say these people are the reason I'm able to do what I'm doing. So hopefully everyone who has had the interaction with me can confirm that I always take a bit of time for them. Also today, you saw it yourself. I'm dinner, I'm canceling my dinner. I'm taking pictures with people uh, because, well, that's what I find. That's the least what I can do back for them, for them actually watching my stuff over the last eight years or even longer. Some people have been there even way before yes. I've been doing YouTube, which is quite crazy. Uh, but indeed, it does give people opportunity to come and actually meet me. And at the same time, since I am this open and approachable, at least I like to consider myself being open and approachable, uh, even people who came today, for some of them, they said, this was for me the reason to come and meet you. I'm like, okay, but you can meet me here every day at Nürburgring, at Apex Parking, and in the future, like at another company's parking or whatever, or another event. Um, but it does give us actually like specific time that we can spend together with these people because today we spent three hours walking on track, having dinner or like uh, have some snacks and doing a giveaway. It's something that they cannot otherwise get because of course we can have five minute interaction and a couple of pictures, but in this way we can really come closer and like really talk about cars, talk about stuff. And uh, I think it's going to be indeed great. And one of the things I actually took inspiration from is Auto Alex that you had on the on the channel. I have been amazed by the amount of the type of events he's been able to put off from last year, from Matt Wood to Shed Fest and all the other things. I'm like, this is freaking cool. And that's also something that I would like to offer to my audience and do cool stuff together. And also, I also wrote to Alex, I'm like, let's do event together. A live Road to Success podcast at the Nürburgring. In the hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you just made it weird. <laughs> uh, well, the weirdest stuff is that that's what gets you the views, so why not? Mm. But on the other side, you are also sticking to your word with the lad that you met through your videos and is starting an engineering company. Yes. January the 1st. Um, officially, yes. But unofficially, probably somewhere in February once we come back from the holiday. And this lad left his job at Ferrari yes. to pursue this. Yes. So what are you calling it? This was a very difficult uh, decision to make when it comes to choosing a name because that's something, I mean, we're dreaming big. Uh, the sweater I'm wearing from Riemanns Automobili. Ten years ago, this was a company that was just in the garage and Matt Riemanns, who was working on his BMW E30 and put electric motors in. And nowadays, it's the world-renowned hypercar manufacturer that owns Bugatti and whatnot. Like, the majority of today's supercars and some of the hypercars run their technology even, even though they're not, like, on the Riemanns brand. So it's fantastic what they have built. So... Of course, we're also dreaming big, and who knows where we're going to be in 10 years. Maybe we're going to be bankrupt in two months. Who knows? But dream big, and one day you might achieve that. So that name needs to have something really special. And we thought about it, thought about it. So what we came up with is actually quite generic and basic. Um, it's going to be called Vulcan Alpha. And the reason for that, there's actually a story behind it, because I was, again, as I told you, I'm a history geek. I want to have history. So Vulcan is a Roman name for Hephaestus. Hephaestus, the forger of the underworld, uh, who was forging the weapons for the Greek gods, or in this case, the Roman gods, who was caught in the underworld, uh, underworld or in hell. Now, Lapo, Italian guy, is an engineer or a forger, and he comes to the green hell to make something in Italian. And Vulcan, we have here the Vulcan Eiffel, and also, the, again, the name of this giant who was making the forges in uh, in, in the Roman uh, mythology, etc. 
we are this region is called Vulcan Eiffel, the Eiffel region with the, which is built on the volcanic plates. And like, okay, this matches and this matches and it has a story. And Vulcan is also a universal name uh, because Vulcan, volcano, whatever. It, it sounds similar, identical, pretty much every language. Because if you would call it something else, everyone will know it's what it is. It's a mean name as well. It's a mean name. It has also this like explosive performance. Uh, I think the, you need to start a name generating business <laughs> online. <laughs> Give a little discount code yeah. in the videos because yeah. the two that you've mentioned, if anybody sat there probably giggling that, that have had to do the bit where you sit down and create a name for your business or for your shop, it's one of the hardest parts of the whole journey. And to yeah. actually find names that aren't just like Fowler Digital because it's yeah. easy, yeah. to actually find a name like um, 3MD. Yeah. It's like, how does someone come up with that? But maybe it pays to have that knowledge of history. Uh, maybe, maybe, who knows? Uh, but that's the name we decided to go with. And actually you saying that you, you had Fowler, or you have Fowler Digital. Um, Lapo was being told, especially by people at Ferrari, you need to have your last name included in there because, well, Ferrari, Porsche, and Rimats. Actually, everyone is bearing the last name. If you Lamborghini. Want to, exactly. If you want to go into the automotive business, it's good to have your last name. And his name is also unique. He's the only person or his family is the only family in the whole of Italy that bears the name of Korenic. And it's, uh, it has its roots in Croatia. So yeah, but in Italy, he's the only one. So that would have been something. But then at the same time, since we're part business owners, we're like, okay, we're going to call it 2C or we're just going to put it his name. There were lots of thoughts and lots of ideas, but this is something that uh, Vulcan alone was nice. We wanted to go for Vulcan Ultimate, and eventually we decided to go for Vulcan Alpha because um, it sounds, again, easier. It rolls off a tongue very easy. Vulcan Alpha. Alpha is also the first, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, the prime performance, the, the prime explosive performance that you might get. And... Um, yeah, let's see where it's going to end up with. And where are you basing that? <laughs> Keeping everything local? It will be across the road from Apex. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how everything comes back around, isn't it? <laughs> what I really found interesting there was it, it can be... It can always sound amazing to us when we, and for me when I sit opposite you and you've had so many successes this year. You know, as you said, you had the, that pinch me moment, which people, a lot of people do get. We actually sat there with the ability to purchase a business. Mm -hmm. When you flash back what seems like a short amount of time, you wouldn't have believed mm -hmm. that you could have possibly been in that position. But you just mentioned somebody prior that you actually look up to in what they've done as well. Because you say many people will look up to mm -hmm. the position you're in. I would like to actually delve into who you who you look up to on the things that you're doing. You just mentioned Matteo Rimac because I was looking at him the other day and I thought, right, so he runs Rimac as a company. Which Rimac, is, you're Rimac. going to get burnt in the comments <sighs> by Maybe all the Balkan now. people. Yes. <laughs> but he's also another CEO of Bugatti. Exactly. That's two really big jobs in itself right there. And it's amazing how people spin these plates and actually manage to make them succeed because one of the views from the olden days, and certainly from, I'd say, prehistoric directors and shareholders on boards, is that, you know, you can only do one thing. You mm -hmm. do that one thing, you do it really well. And what we're seeing more of now in people is actually the ability to potentially, because more of us, probably have ADHD than ever before, <laughs> whether that's caused by digital devices and phones and Who knows? watching 400 laps a day of Misha going around the ring mm -hmm. in a modified caddy, or whatever it may be. But why, why would you say that you look up to Rimats more than others? I mean, there are lots of, lots of reasons. I mean, I look up to many, many people, many successful people, uh, Every guest that has been on your podcast, because your podcast is number one podcast that I've listened to this year, I've listened to every single one of them and everyone, many of those people I know personally, I know the backstories uh, and I'm inspired and impressed because everyone actually started or many of them started with nothing and they had downfalls. And every successful person, I believe your last guest said it very nicely. If you take off the shoes of those people, you will see that they walked through glass, through nails, and they had lots of things. Since you mentioned Mate Rimac, he is again one of the most inspiring people for me because he started in his garage. He started in Croatia, which is for me one of the most, if not the most beautiful countries in the world, but it's a country with absolutely zero car industry. 
And there he was saying like, we're gonna build this car, we're gonna build this brand. And everyone, including his mother, that's what he's been openly saying, have been saying, please stop, because the longer you go on, the more people you're gonna take down with you, because it's not going to be a success. And he had lots of, lots of issues. In 2017, which is not even so long ago, I believe, uh, the company, uh, they had the electricity shut off like two or three times a year because they Ironic. did. Ironic. Because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ironic. Because they couldn't pay the, pay the electricity bills because the priority was pay everyone's wages and then comes everything next. And a couple of times it was okay. Electricity was shut off for one day because they need to get the money. The company was really on the brink of survival for many, many times, many, many years, I would say, until... It got popularity until there was the famous hill climb crash by Richard Hammond, and there were lots of more things. And again, important to know is that Rimac is not a car manufacturer company. Yes, they produce hypercars, but this is just an, mostly an exposure piece to show the outside world, look what we can do, we can do the same for you. Because one of the most important things is because Porsche acquired and invested a lot of money, they acquired a piece of Rimac's and also Hyundai invested a lot in them um, because they're doing these mind-blowing things. They were doing them already back then. And this is what got them to the position now. It's amazing. Most people that are kind of visionaries in this world, in in those fields, it all comes back to electric. It's like Edison you, with the light can, bulb or it's Elon with Tesla is someone that I of, look up to. Yeah, exactly. And speaking of e Elon, just quickly mention because there was another thing on my mind. Everyone now thinks because when you just think of a person like, okay, he has 200 billion plus whatever, whatnot. But there are also like articles about him or like from his ex-girlfriends where he was just like going mentally insane because he was about, to, he needed to secure, I, I believe like 200 million euro investment to save Tesla from going bankrupt and he did it like a few hours before he had to make that payment. So people were going through lots of tough times. And back then, even three years ago, even now people still say Tesla is a scam, this is a scam. Even now people, when there is another world record achievement coming from Rimac, there is some guy from Croatia gonna say like, oh, it's a scam. He is like, he's a charlatan or whatever. So, and even again, going back to, Lewis Hamilton, Max Verstappen, you can be the best person out there. People still gonna talk down on you. It doesn't matter. It, if you're gonna be walking on water, the haters gonna be saying it's because you cannot swim. So it's, you're always gonna have these kinds of negative things. So again, for people out there, the successful you're gonna get, the more hate you're gonna get towards you. And at the end of the day, that's because people judge themselves on their intentions and others on their actions. Where do you think the cap is or where do you think the ceiling is for your channel? Because I, there's been a lot of YouTube channels and the people that I speak to that end up hitting ceilings. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. You see people that fly along and then suddenly they find the roof to the channel. And you mentioned that one of the things that's really done well for you is the discovery of shorts, the ability that your content is quite reproducible. It's a YouTuber's dream. Yes. What do you believe is possible with your platform in terms of reach? Because as we were mentioning earlier at dinner, the Nürburgring is just one location at the mm -hmm. minute. How do you develop on that? Um, it's hard to answer that question. I mean, what is the, I mean, the only limitation is your imagination, you know? So it's, uh, where is the where is the reach? How many people do actually care about the Nürburgring? When am I going to have enough of making videos? When will I be stopped from making videos? When will the world perspective on the cars become completely different that people will associate with driving anything with the electrical internal combustion engine will become the diabolical? But so, do you set yourself goals in terms of numbers? No. Do you chase them? No, I never did that. I never did that, and I'm still not doing that. Because if people come here to drive, like ask me to drive with their literally shitbox or something, I might prefer that over taking a Ferrari out or something. But maybe it's easy to say that when there's no more... There's no severe financial stress like there was at the beginning from the YouTube channel because it's big enough that it was always developed. It will always bring in a certain level of income, mm -hmm. say that channel. So maybe you stop striving for the next. But when you first started, 
were you ever in the mindset of I need to get to 100k I need to get to 200k as a YouTuber no absolutely not it, it was something let, let's say that way as I said at the beginning I found myself in like in the like fortunate enough and I, I've been flabbergasted by the fact that I'm able to do things that I'm able to do now like this is crazy because I never thought that this would be possible this would be the goal because always in life for me like emotional uh, or let's say no, 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 sorry. Um, what's it called? The material things in life have absolutely no meaning to me. Like when you look at me, the stuff that I'm wearing, okay, this sweater is like four years old. This shirt that I have gotten for free from uh, Evo Jan, from my dear friend, I've been wearing for the last two years is because I'm not buying any like fancy clothes. I'm not buying a project car. So there is no chase of becoming the best. Would you ever buy your own supercar? Well, I wanted to buy a Porsche this year. Then I didn't. You don't have to, do you? <laughs> That's the luxury. And that is indeed, we can go in circles here having this conversation because one of your first reactions when I told you, hey, I will buy, be buying Apex. And you said, this is amazing because it's great seeing, you see so many YouTubers who decide to buy a supercar and then they get stuck to it. And then they, they have a downfall and then they have emotional and financial breakdown. And now you're actually going out to do something else. You're being thrown in the cold water and you go uh, pursue either. Hey, either it's yeah, fucking either. boiling, isn't it? It's getting, getting hot in here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, we totally forgot where we're at there. Yeah, yeah no, we were talking about uh, buying a car. Um, yeah. And, and this is a, another thing, because to be honest, another conversation we haven't covered in the last podcast, but you, uh, it stuck with me when we spoke the night before recording that podcast. And I told you about my choices, my decisions in life that le led up to this, what I'm doing right now, is that I never cared about money in the sense of, for me, it was just a number. Like I'm getting something and I'm like, okay, next month I can probably do a race. I can 12 hour race, 24 hour race. I can do this. I can do that. And actually, until like last well, last year, pretty much, I've been living paycheck to paycheck, but on a very big, scalable way because I was spending everything that was coming in, literally everything on like personal things, to travels, to, to content, or actually, and only from last year on, I decided to actually kind of invest it in certain things. And it started with buying gear like the the camera gear because in the past i would be filming the vlogs from my phone or just the gopro and then i invested thirty thousand euros in all the fancy camera equipment because i also hired the cameraman adrian that was that moved from poland to here to make videos together with me and then in the middle of this year which was another shock for me is that he left because he said i cannot deal with the life here at the Nürburgring anymore because i miss the city life i miss being able to go and do certain things and i totally understood that and we're still again on a good note because he's coming back because he moved to switzerland now he has a good job there and he's still occasionally coming back to film certain film projects together so again we're also not on bad terms we're good it's because and i understand i told him if i would not be well doing what i'm doing that i would be gone from the Nürburgring as well because living here is tough because uh, you have nothing here you see you see it yourself you're in the middle of um you're in the middle of the hills quite literally uh, yeah. I, th I think it's quite good that it didn't snow because we might not be up here near the track entrance we might more be mm. down in the village below mm -hmm. because it is unbelievably mountainous around here but your roads are so much better than the roads in the UK yeah. I cannot even describe how much better the roads are. They're like this table. In the UK, you go down the road and it's like... <laughs> and then there's just like a massive hole. <laughs> this destroyer of cars. Yeah. But here, it's amazing. It, it is amazing. But before we get too much sidetracked, oh, what I started saying is like, yeah, I started investing actually in certain things and indirectly, indirectly was in the YouTube channel. I wanted to improve it. It has paid off, whether it was because of the type of content I started producing or the higher quality of videos or probably goes hand in hand. And as I'm getting older, as I'm getting more serious in a relationship, thinking of uh, starting a family, and I'm thinking, okay, what about what about the future? Again, I said, I do not want to be doing these laps all the time in the future. I want to move away from it, not 
that I hate it. I definitely do not hate it, but I do not, it's not the main thing that I want to be doing. You want to have some passive income because who knows what's going to happen. Maybe the CEO is going to change of the Nürburgring. You said, well, we're going to block Misha. We're not going to allow him to make videos anymore or whatever might happen. And I'm too dependent of that. Or someone says you can't do a track day. Yeah. Well, it shows. It shows. Of Why course. do you think that is? Why I cannot do a track day. Yeah. What? Well, no, it's not that I cannot do a track day. It's because, I mean, what we need to explain here, I applied to get a date for a track day for next year to, to become one of the track day organizers. And the Nürburgring is a very unique place in the world because it has 365 days a year busyness. It's like occupied every single day. There is something happening. Even though the track is closed now, we were together having dinner. The track is closed. It should be dead. There was a shit ton of people in the restaurant. Why is that? Because there was some convention, a boulevard for IT technologies. So there's always something happening. And when it comes to track days, it's almost impossible to get track day time because you have track days, you have industry pool, you have all re lap record attempts, you have marketing activities. And when it comes to track days, um, Nürburgring gives first access to their existing customers who have been with them for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. They give them the dates first. And if someone cancels out, then they might say like, okay, someone else might have it. I didn't make the cut, no big deal, because I don't have to spend 70 grand all of a sudden. I might go and rent another track, do the track day somewhere else, expand, venture. When one door closes, a lot of them might become open, you know? So it's, I'm not really sad about not doing a track day at the Nürburgring because there was not, it was a great thing, but it's a one thing only. There are so many other tracks out there. There are so many venues out there. Um, there are so much things we can do and that's what we'll be wanting to be doing. How important is the downtime for you, the off season? Because it's clear that you have a strategy through that. You film your content beforehand in the summer. You make sure you have videos to last you throughout it. But are you, are you happy the fact that the, the actual ring for driving closes throughout I the winter? I love it. I absolutely love it because again, uh, every single year, and regardless whether I'm a successful YouTuber or I'm doing lots of laps, whether it's me, everyone in the region by September and after September, everyone wants to kill each other. Because in September, like also July, June, you have the busiest months. So let me tell you like the, the last couple of weeks that were going on in September, you have maybe like three track days on the, on the week, or like, let's say the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday or something. This means a track day starts at eight o'clock. You need to be before you get up at six, you go to the track, you start doing your content, preparing, getting from in the car to the car. The track day finishes at 4.30 and at 5.15, the, the tourist drive start. So you have completely different type of driving uh, and you start driving those, for example, that, uh, that finishes at 7.30. Then you come back home, try to get maybe some dinner and you need to edit a video probably for tomorrow's date because you need to prepare it for that. So you do that until, I don't know, like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. Depends how long the video is. You prepare also social media because mind you, I'm doing everything by myself because my camera guy slash editor left. And even before he was mostly camera guy, he was editing only, I would say, 10 to 15% of the videos. So I'm doing everything by myself. Aside from that, I need to stay fit. So I try to go to the gym because I need to be fit by for be driving all those cars and then try to find also uh, time for your private life to spend your time with not only your future wife, but also with your dogs that you need to walk occasionally and spend some time with them. And then meanwhile, answer all the messages and the questions, etc. So then you go to bed at one or 2 a.m. At six o'clock, you need to get up again and you start the whole cycle again. So you can do that for maybe a week, but not for two or three consecutive months. And there's a lots of, that's only content creation and driving. And then you have all these like personal things going on and uh, other problems that you might have, that everyone has. Everyone has some certain things going on in their lives. I mean, you might have thousand problems and until you have a health problem, then you have only one problem, you know? So everyone has issues. And of course, then at that time, like that's usually September, August by August, everyone's like, we're drained, we're done. We do not want to talk to everyone. You start, you need to have downtime. So again, also from content creation side, I'm happy that the track is closed. But at the same time, 
now we're thinking like, okay, when the next year the track is closed, maybe we'll go to the Emirates and to US because that's when actually when there the season starts. So we might do some track days there. We might do some driving. We might do who knows what we'll be doing. So we have some plans. And eventually if that can evolve into a business and I can kind of step more away from YouTube or let's say not have this pressure of like, I need, I need, I need, but do it more for fun and combine it, then I think that will be the ultimate goal. So... I think after our little break then again, thank God the cameras need a rest every now and then because I do too. <laughs> we should get on to your racing and the racing that you've also done this year and in the past. I mean, you're a professional race driver. Nah. And this year you competed in 12 hours of Nürburgring. Yeah. How did that go? Ooh. Uh, well, first of all, before you're going to call me a professional driver, <laughs> you're going to get lots of hate <laughs> from the people. It's actually a funny one because... so. The thing is, I've been racing already since, let me say, 2011. Like my one of my first car experiences, so I bought my first car. Immediately, once I bought my first car, I went to get the racing. Uh, I booked a race car driver course without intention of doing racing, but just to increase my car skill. And then I think I explained the story of how I ended up like having a 700 horsepower time attack car back at the time. So I was already racing back then. Then fast forward to 2019, when I was able to get... Uh, again, more money after being financially broke in between, I started racing at the Nürburgring already back at the time. So I was already racing four years ago. I was driving BMW M240 Cup car. Uh, the first three races that I did, I came, uh, came together with my uh, uh, teammate on P1. So uh, place one out of, I believe, like what, 10 or 12 competitors. Uh, the fourth race, unfortunately, I had a crash. And then the fifth race, I think, were also... Uh, first or second. So it was quite successful back then already. And I drove already a couple of endurance races back then. So it was going on then. The big difference that happened this year that I became, I would say, a contract signed driver for Bilstein and Black Falcon. Bilstein, the world's largest leader suspension manufacturers and Black Falcon is the local racing team. So we have, I have contract with both companies and I'm fortunate enough and honored to represent them on the racing field. <laughs> now that was funny because as I was getting uh, popular on the social media, you would say, you know, and uh, also becoming more a target of some hateful comments, uh, mostly from the local people. That's the funny part because most of the hate comes from the locals which it's for me hard to understand. Wow. Be with, yeah, because everyone outside, they, they love my content, they love me, me, but some of the people like, well, he is what he is, not going to go into that. And I don't know why, because I'm always like approachable guy. I'm happy to work with everyone to... Maybe it's because you make this place busier, so you take up their That's funny. That's That's been actually a big, uh, <laughs> one of the complaints from people like Misha is making the Nibbukrin worse because he's making it too popular. Like, well... Let's complain about Sabine, God rest her soul, who made it, this place extremely popular in the first place with Jeremy Clarkson back in the days. Because before that, you could literally, 20 years ago, you could stop on the track, get out of the car, take some pictures, have picnic and drive on. Nobody would care. That's how empty it was back then. That's why also eventually Nürburgring went bankrupt. Well, there were other reasons behind it, which which led to the sale from the government to be, becoming the privately owned property. But yeah, and I, I think it's a compliment if people actually think that I made this place too popular. I think that's the biggest pop, uh, compliment I can get as a Nürburgring content creator. So, um, but yeah, what I was getting to before we got sidetracked, uh, I remember there was like a post on uh, one of the local Facebook groups about like, oh, Misha, blah, 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 bad driver. Why the, why the hell do people like trust him? And people started defending me like, yeah, but he's like professional or something, a professional driver. And people started asking like, Oh, what does then? Okay, what does some make someone a professional driver? What is a professional? What is driver? a professional driver? And then people started saying like, yeah, if you have a contract or you represent a manufacturer. And then I'm reading this like, ha ha! Next week we're gonna announce the actual <laughs> deal <laughs> that we've been working to for the last year or so because uh, the the deal and the making has been of course going on for a while. It's not that you all of a sudden like, hey, you want to race next week? You're gonna represent us? If you're a works driver, maybe yes. But there was lots of things going on, so that's when we announced that. And then all of a sudden, 
Of course, those haters, like I said, if you will be walking on water, they're going to say it's because you cannot swim. There will be always a counter argument. So now I have a contract, but it's not because of your driving skills. It's because of your marketing abilities. Well, great. Where are your marketing abilities if that's that easy? And <laughs> my favorite story that Maggie always tells me, or like she told me once, and that always stuck with me because, again, drunk people at the bar coming to her and so some of those like drunk people like I think I'm you know I know for sure I'm a better driver than Misha <laughs> okay and what she would say is like I think that I could be a better model than Naomi Campbell the only difference is I only think that and she actually made it so everyone who thinks is free to do what they can do and they should do anyway um, but what makes some what makes someone a professional racing driver? How, when can you call yourself that? I don't know. I mean, if you win a race, if you compete in classes, if you compete in series, if you let, drive let, let, every day, if you earn your living from there, does that make you professional, dude? Th this is we can go on for so long, and luckily we have unlimited time on this podcast because we can talk like really long time. Okay, what does it make someone professional? If they have a contract and they earn their living with it, I earn my money by driving cars and driving cars on track as well, directly and indirectly, I earn my money with it. Does it make me professional? Um, maybe. But then you can say like, yeah, but you're not as fast as other guys. Well, fine. What about with like 99, well, everyone who is not P1 and driving Formula One race? Like, you know, even speaking of Hamilton, he hasn't won a single race. This season. This for the season. first time, it, well, I think the first time ever, Steve? this season or last season yeah. oh he didn't race, he didn't he didn't win last season either Hamilton yeah. did he so not a single win yet he is one of the greatest oh did he won seven times the these won the world championship seven, seven times. times should have been eight times should have been yeah we can yeah okay we can, we can <laughs> but I did that for Steve over there sat in the corner who literally yeah. has Hamilton's number tattooed on his arm but, I, I yeah. appreciate that but does that make all of a sudden Hamilton not a professional driver because he hasn't won so does it make me not a professional driver because I'm not as performing? What is a professional driver? I don't know. And when we go again deeper into the world of racing, in the touring class racing and everything below that, endurance racing, everything that's not like GT3 spec, the 95% of the paddock of the drivers are just gentleman drivers who go to the team. Here is five, 10, 20, 100,000 euros. Let me drive this car for this race or this amount of race or for this season. And this is what get, gets motorsport going. They write it off as a business expense, as marketing expense for their own company and blah, blah, blah. And then they get to call themselves a professional driver. Great. The big difference is no one cares about their performance because they're low key. So no one is watching them. They can tell their friends, hey, I'm a professional driver. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And their friends have no clue about motorsport and they don't care. So again, going to the fact to like, Going back to like, there's so many. So, do yes. you think you're a professional driver? No, I. Why? Well, because this is not my only thing that I aspire to be and want to be doing. So, a professional driver, if he wants to compete like professionally, every single driver is a tremendous athlete. First of all, I'm 20 kilos heavier. So because I prefer like physical, like strength training, and I, I wouldn't say bodybuilding because even that I don't have enough time to do so. I do not cycle from here 200 kilometers to improve my stamina. I do not have the time for it. And I would rather spend time with my family or with my dogs or with my friends. So I do not take priority of competing and being like this type of crazy pro. The pinnacle. The pinnacle. That's what sets me apart because I take joy from life of doing other things. So this is what sets me apart of not being professional. First and foremost, I'm an entertainer when it comes to driving. So if someone asks, are you a professional driver? I'm saying, no, I drive cars and sometimes I'm good at them in comparison. But I, in a way, yes, okay, I'm professional, I'm getting paid for it and I'm driving them. But I'm nowhere near and will never be nowhere near than all these other top dogs out there because even there are lots of, I would say, significantly more people out there, not even professionally competing, that are significantly faster than me because for the same reason, they also don't care about being fast or competing, but they are simply 
uh, for whichever reason. It could be talent. It could be because they taught the skill uh, or they focus more on it. And they are significantly better drivers than I am. So does it make them professional? How much of racing and driving fast do you think needs to be natural talent and how much can be developed? And the reason I say this, just to touch on it quickly, is uh, my next door neighbor's kid, uh, Louis Austin. He is only 15, yet he is top of the charts on so many sim racing league boards. And he goes to uh, Podium, <coughs> the partners of the podcast, he goes on their sims and he literally beats professional racing drivers each month on their leaderboard and tops the charts. And I'm like, the, you've never even like, how? You barely practice. And like, it does make you go, and he's so, so, so young. So it, it emphasizes you go, how are you doing this? So do you think that you had that natural talent or do you think that you developed it? No, I have zero natural talent. First of all, I mean, I said already, like I got my driver's license when I was like 19 or 20. I was like coming from Russia and then like having this whole, like moving to Netherlands and having this fucked up youth in a way. Um, I never was like in a cart or in like, I didn't have money to be in a cart, let alone from my parents. Like, you know, so, so I did not have that experience. And again, lots of local guys, lots of professional uh, kids, including all the Formula One champions, they start by being four years old, they get put in a cart for either out of joke or actually because their father or mom, they want them to have fun or become something driver or most importantly that because they have the funds to do so. And then they grow, progress to from a cart to, to a European championship, world championship to actually get scouted to Formula 3, 2, and then eventually one if they're lucky and if they have the money. Because even the, the karting will cost you 250 grand for a season easily, maybe half a million even, depends. Depends what kind of competition you're running. Because if you have unlimited budget, you're going to get like a new engine every uh, this amount of time, new tires every this amount of time, and it gets crazy. You have to travel the world as well. It's There's a lot of commitment. There's a lot of budget involved. So if you do not have money, you might have all the talent in the world. You're not going to make it. That was in the past. Because nowadays, like you said, this neighbor kid of yours is practicing on a sim. We have Jimmy Broadband, who is like my teammate, who is, uh, who started... Sim racing in his mom's shed and making content out of it. Last year, he won the Praga Championship. This year, he is among us. He's the fastest driver. He's only, I think, two seconds off the lap record in our class. He's extremely fast, extremely talented. You have also, for example, uh, people like Tim Heinemann, another German driver who was a sim racer and now is racing for Falcon racing team and KW and racing in DTM and also doing 24 hour race. So he has proven that from a sim, you can come into natural, well, in a natural race. So it is possible by being consistent and being motivated, but yeah, everything but needs to work out. As much as you say that you're not a professional in your mind, you competed, as we said, in the 12 hours of the Nürburgring mm -hmm. this year on the GP circuit. Mm. No. The combined circuit, the North the Life the and, the, and the GP. Yes. How did that go? Whoo -hoo. Well, I mean, that was one of the most uh, eventful events of my life. Um, so this was our first race, the official race that we would compete in as a team, the Bilstein and Black Falcon together with Jimmy and Steve. Um, so <laughs> on... Saturday morning, I lost the car in qualifying and went in the wall. The car crashed. We thought that the car was going to be totaled maybe when we couldn't find out because we were stuck on a tow truck for almost two hours. That was at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, it has to do most likely with the oil spill because there was a massive oil spill from that particular section to the end. There were, I think, three or four more other cars that crashed. Um, it was very unfortunate and everyone who has watched the video, you see me just turning and slightly and the car just goes instantly. It was just like nothing I could have done. Anyway, all the driver excuses aside or the reasons the, the car was in the wall, we had to repair it and we didn't know if the car could be make it back in time. When the car made it back into the pits, uh, the team Black Falcon made a quick assessment of the damage and they said, okay, it's not that horrible. The only problem is it's a production spec car. This means you have just a production car that you can go to the showroom, buy as, in this case, BMW 330, and you can convert it to a race car, which we have done, and also other cars. Or you have factory cup cars 
that you go and buy Porsche GT3 Cup or BMW M240 or GT3, GT4. Those are like factory race cars. And for those cars, if you're in a paddock and you have a damage, like you can ride off a complete GT3 car, you go to the trailer of BMW Motorsport and you buy pretty much brand new car in parts like a Lego, but it's very easy to assemble. And you have within half an hour with a professional team, you can have a fully like functioning car again. In case of our car, we had some spare parts. We had to go to other teams who run the same parts and they said, well, we can give you those parts if you can give us replacement parts before the start of the race. And the start of the race was, I think we were lucky because there was a Formula One Red Bull event that day. It was actually significantly later. The race would start, I think, at three o'clock instead of usual 12 o'clock. So we had like three additional hours. So that we made a list of parts. We could go to the dealers, local de dealers, pick up parts there. But the funniest thing, all of a sudden someone realized, hold on a second, in the Nürburgring Boulevard, Bilstein is having a stand for our meet and greet where they have uh, another BMW 330 standing their company car, their fleet car, which is actually all we need because engine, everything, everything is straight. We only need like exterior parts, the headlight, the, the bumper, the this and that. Can we have that? And well, Bilstein agreed, said, yeah, okay, you can have that. And that is something that is impressive that such a big company that they're willing to actually sacrifice their fleet car and go through so much trouble because they trust so much in the project. It's not just like marketing exercise for them. It's again, this emotional involvement that you want to win, to prove something, to actually have something in motorsport is passion. That's why people are doing that. Like you, you might end up broke, but you're like really pouring your soul and heart and passion into this and it's the, the money pet exactly yeah if you want to make become a millionaire with racing you got to start as a billionaire so that's what it is <laughs> <laughs> it's quite good <laughs> yeah exactly so they gave us this car we went to meet and greet the car got disassembled stripped and then we got a message after like one hour okay you're going to be starting the race we thought we we might race tomorrow or the like i don't know later but we actually could make the start of the race which was amazing we rush to the pit box, Jimmy get in the car. We start from the back because we didn't qualify because, well, thanks to me. Um, we start and in the first lap, two cars collide, crash into each other. And then one of the cars crashes into our car, goes into the door. Luckily it misses the rear wheel. So the suspension didn't get destroyed, but the wheel, uh, the door got damaged and the mirror flew off as well. So we had no rear view mirror and well, the door, whatever, nothing with that. So. Uh, Jimmy still drives tremendous stint, very good. I think he was like, he managed to climb to like even P4 or five wow. from, from the end in class, of course, among I think were 12 or 13 people. Uh, for full detailed report, go watch the video I made on that race because so don't quote me on the exact numbers at this point. Um, and uh, he gives the car to Steve, he does well. And then it was my time to drive, but uh, first of all, not going to lie, I had lots of emotional stress, aside from the stuff happening at home and blah, 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 blah. Uh, most importantly, I just came out of the crash. When we, I'm thinking, okay, my career here is over. Like, you know, like I crashed the car and uh, uh, unlucky. And you always have this like post-crash, not syndrome, but like you you kind of, you're anxious of driving again. What might happen now? You're not on it. You're not on it. You, and you're careful because you do not want to have the same mistake because then you have... You really fucked it up then. You're driving to your, what you know and what you feel, but not with your natural talent. This, exactly. But that aside, we are now racing in the darkness because it was night race. So while they were driving in daylight, I'm now racing at night with two different headlights because the headlight came from another car. So it could, because nowadays all the cars are smart asses. You need to have two identical cars and program the headlight control unit. So the, the headlights were shining kind of more in the air instead of like on the track. And I have no rear view mirror. So you have then again, also GT4 cars, GT3 cars behind coming up to you, flashing at you and you're like, shit, are you going left or right behind me? You don't see anything there. It's, it's horrible. So I managed to baby the car until the last half an hour. And then unfortunately in a corner, another cop car that was overtaking me slammed into my wheel because, well, from my side, when we look at the onboard from my side, the team said, well, this is bad. He crashed into you because you were staying on your line and you did not indicate you didn't give him any right to pass. And he went for it and they're very strict. 
at the Nürburgring because the multi-class racing that they want to keep alive. So the every every driver's briefing they emphasize slow cars watch out for fast cars fast cars watch out for slow cars we really will penalize if people try to do some stupid overtaking maneuver so we went to race control they summoned the other team they looked from their onboard perspective and they said you know what from your onboard it looks that you're right from his onboard it looks that he's right it's just a racing incident we cannot say that it was like very obvious that someone is at fault well okay we yeah it, it was a dnf so unfortunately so next day on Sunday, it was the second part of the race because even though, as we said, it's a 12 hour race, it was actually two times six hours. One one day and the second day was the second race. Uh, the race started in qualifying. The car was still showing some technical uh, issues. So the gearbox was sometimes upshift by itself or downshift by itself because it had like a massive impact and not everything could have been replaced. Traction control was sometimes kicking by itself, which is like saying, oh, an, yeah. an, another big issue. So um, Steve did qualify. No, he did uh, warm up and he would start the race. It went well. Uh, Jimmy drove the race as well. Uh, it went well. I think we actually ended up being, I think, P3 or P2 at some point. Uh, don't quote me on that, but we're like in a very impressive position. I get in the car. On the first lap, the car dies on me. So the engine just like falls out and I'm already stressed with a having crashed be before and then having someone else crashed into me. And I'm like thinking, what is the next big thing? And you see it also on onboard video. I start swearing like crazy. I'm like, you fucking piece of shit. Like, <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> it's, lost it, gone. I lost it because like, yeah, I'm driving like, you know, it's like, okay, well, that's it. End of the race. So I roll through, I, I stop restart the engine by the time of course people overtake me we're losing positions i start driving we drive uh x amount of hours like i think hour and a half or something and drive because it was like a two hour stint basically and the car dies again so eventually we made it to p5 out of i think 12 people with all these difficulties and all these issues and it was amazing. Like, even though I was completely drained because having crashes, having issues, having everything, but it showed what the teamwork can do. And everyone at the end was super happy because we made the finish line. It was our first race. And throughout all of these setbacks, we still made it. And that was fantastic. And of course, on one hand, people were saying like, oh yeah, uh, this was just P5, you're a shit driver. I'm like, yeah, but this was our first race and we're competing against people who've been driving for decades, they're literally starting with BMW E36 to then to 46, so E90, to this next moving gen. on to the next gen, who've been driving literally for 10 years, who've been doing that, who are professional drivers. They're really professional drivers because that's what they are doing uh, constantly. And we're coming up with, yeah, same races and a YouTuber, and we are going to do something. And um, it was great. And to be honest, speaking in terms of YouTube, this was the best thing that has happened to us as a team from sponsor marketing advertising perspective because there was so much drama and it was a happy end and that's what people loved and everyone was eager for us to perform even better next race have we gone there and be, maybe even became p1 people will be like okay cool great or p2 or p3 well fine but because there was like so many setbacks and we overcame them as a team and we actually kind of had a happy end i think that was eventually a very good thing and alongside that, we I'm guessing you had help with actually recording that experience. Or were you also thinking about that as well? Like, because you, you filmed everything. You said you do a lot of the work yourself. You've no longer got your camera guy. How did you actually capture all that while staying focused on racing? Yeah, so this race was one of the last races that actually my camera guy okay. was so there. Well on that cusp. Yeah, he, he, he was there to record like mostly a lot of b-roll so but because i was like really emotionally drained i was not there vlogging actively like oh guys and right now they were doing i did maybe like two takes and for the rest i'm like okay i'm done with this i cannot like really mentally i'm in the zone i'm racing yeah well racing or i'm just like really not i cannot fake a smile in front of it and, and be like you know so the decision was made so i would do like a narrative video so he had lots of b-rolls of everything happening and i did a narration of saying what happened in the past and why it happened and it actually ended up being a good video but yes in the coming races the second race we by the way finished on podium we got a p3 
So it was like an even very sweet victory for us, a personal victory. Um, those races I indeed was completely on my own. So I'm filming something, Maggie is helping me. So yeah, there is also a pressure or obligation towards the people that make the racing possible. So you do need to make content and you make it need to make it in the best possible way. You cannot say, I'm not going to publish this video because you need to say something because you also owe it to your subscribers and also to your sponsors. And there's a lot of pressure behind it. Do you prefer racing in that scenario as a team with a car, albeit when you crash that car, a hell of a lot of responsibility you feel on your shoulders and weight? Or do you prefer the kind of roots of your channel of bombing around the full notch life in... 500 horse per caddy. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. The or first, is it both? Um, I think if I would not have, don't get me wrong, for because I know people are going to like put on the, the like grab into words. If I would not have a spotlight on me, people that are curious what I'm performing in racing, there would be so much pressure on doing this. I would enjoy racing a lot more in a way, like I said, like an average gentleman driver. You come, you pee, you drive, you do your thing, and nobody cares about it, what you've done, except for yourself and your friends at the pub that you talk to them in the evening. And that's a very easy going, or unless, of course, you're a factory works driver, that's a completely different story. But right now, there's like this urge to perform that I am enjoy doing this. It's amazing to be able to say I'm doing what I'm doing. But yes, I do enjoy just having the the fun, the shits and giggles of sitting in the car and driving and not competing for the fastest time or just doing it because you're having fun. You and the car owner laugh about it and having fun. When you crashed yes. in that qualifying lap, do, in the moment, does the thought of everything else you do, being a YouTuber, filming the content, uh, thinking about the video, does everything just vanish? And in the moment, it's just a huge amount of weight on your shoulders in a moment like that, especially being having so much pride in what you do. Does that really take a knock? Um, I mean, of course. I mean, like I said, it definitely affected me in my future performances as a driver, as a, well, race car driver in my future races. So it does affect me. But at the Racing same- car drivers do crash, I suppose. <laughs> they do. <laughs> You've got to find them. the limit. <laughs> all of them. All of them. Like, again, Hamilton or- Verstappen, they all have their moments and other drivers who drive behind them, they even crash more often and they're still the top of the top of the world. Everyone crashes. There is no big deal. Even, again, the top dogs here at the Nürburgring who are driving the 24 hours and they represent Porsche, BMW, etc. The majority of the contestants during 24-hour race, they're not making it. They end up crashing. That's the part of the game. That's the part of the... Yeah, it happens. So. And the thing about crashing, actually, what I am now really impressed by and blessed by when I look at how my audience reacts to me crashing cars. In the past, maybe that was like, oh my God, he's a shit driver. Some people still think that. And they're, it's, it's fine. They can think that. And I'm also not considering myself the greatest. It happens to everyone. The majority now understands that it's the part of the game. And especially when I, sometimes it happens that I crash someone else's car. I take full responsibility for it and I rebuild it. I actually rectify it. Whereas here, there are lots of examples, and not only here, but I know lots of concrete, precise examples here at the Nürburgring where someone else was given a car of someone else. They crash it and they're like, not my responsibility. You gave the keys to me. I don't care. Your problem. Thanks. Bye. Whereas I take the full responsibility and say like, you know what? I either buy the car off you or I'm going to rebuild it. Whatever you want. Or I just give you money for it and you fix it yourself we're going to rectify this because you gave me the trust or you, you put the trust in me and you gave me your most precious possession because for the car guys, their car is the most valuable thing in life. And I messed it up or maybe I did not mess it up. Maybe there was like an actual brake failure or there was something like something else. It doesn't matter. It was me driving and I find it shit for you who actually had this amazing experience and all of a sudden has like, well, has a lot of trouble. So I do rectify that. And that is what people really appreciate. <laughs> for me, I find that it needs to be just like a norm, like people need to take responsibility for it. So I, but 
it is great for people to see like, you know what? Yeah, okay, well, you crashed the car, you're healthy, everyone is healthy and you fixed it and it's a great example for everyone out there. So actually crashing cars is not a big deal anymore because people realize that this is just part of the game that you're doing. As long as you're not actively trying to crash a car for content's sake, then it's fine. And you guys are going to compete next year? Yes, that is the plan because the goal of the whole project is to... Uh, drive the 24-hour race of Nürburgring. So what do you think next year does look like for you? <laughs> well, I mean, let's hope it's going to be uh, as successful on the, let's say, on business side, and let's say less stressful on the personal side. And even if the things are changed, it's going to be maybe more successful on the personal side and maybe less successful on the business side. I don't know. But let's talk maybe about some... Uh, goals or the plans and how I hope that they're going to work out. I mean, we, we spoke, of course, about racing and the 24-hour race that we'll be competing. So first and foremost, I hope we'll finish the race because, like I said, the majority of people or like a big part of people do not make it to the finish during the 24 hours of Nürburgring. So I hope we'll finish and even hopefully maybe we'll even get the podium. Everything above is like Fantastic, great. And that's going to be a good, I would say, the first more or less finish of the project. And who knows where we'll go from there. Maybe we'll get even a faster race car. There are, of course, plans and ideas and aspirations and ambitions to do it. Um, and to be honest, at that point, hopefully, maybe in a way, I will be too busy with other things that I will have to say, mm, I have to stop the racing project. Because, again, we are driving now with three people. We need the driver number four. And we were speaking, actually, the initial project started with four drivers. But the driver number four actually dropped out before the announcement saying, like, I'm too busy with my life. And then we were looking for another fourth driver. And a lot of people, professional people, who gave this, who were offered this opportunity to race for a professional team, etc., they said, ah, we're too busy. Like, uh, I cannot do this, although it's my dream, but my current projects go ahead. So who knows? Maybe we'll end up there, but I hope we, I'll be able to find balance in life. So I think that's the most important thing, to find balance among the things and be successful on all the fronts for a bit. Now, of course, in the beginning of the podcast or the first part, we spoke about the future business venture. So we have 3MD, we have Vulcan, we have the third business that I haven't announced yet <laughs> that we will be opening up in uh, the, well, hopefully by March we'll open it and I want to keep it secret for now because I already given you too much away. Uh, but there will be another very exciting part that... Uh, See you in March. <laughs> uh, yes, please, for podcast number three. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we'll wait till summer next year, man. <laughs> um... Yeah, and um, so of course there, I, I'm looking forward to doing events with 3MD, with Marta, Maggie, and Diana, uh, to do events with the Nürburgring, at the Nürburgring, outside the Nürburgring, outside of Europe, who knows? We have lots of plans, uh, lots of ideas. Uh, I hope that after every event, we'll be just as excited as we were today after our first small teaser appetizer, because that was the best feeling ever to actually see everyone happy and say like, wow, this was amazing. We want to do more. Please let us know when the next one is going to come. So that is definitely on the goal just to continue that. And uh, the same with Vulcan, with Lapo and Diana, who is also actually part of this business. Uh, I want to produce our first 3D printed carbon fiber part or like have our first like actual body kit that we make for a car to have our first sale literally because we're at this point we're just like founding the business and setting up everything around it like to have this excitement and at the end of the day if we can pay all the bills and be happy about it I think that's the goal I think that's still the goal that always has been that you really that I want to be just happy about things. I'm not chasing certain numbers because that's when you will be happy, satisfied, and when you will be making great decisions because that's very important. And in a way, slow down somewhere, not to try to chase everything. Like I said, finding balance is going to be the key for next year. And that is, for me, very important. And first and foremost, be healthy, of course. Um, and happy with my, well, 
my family, with my future wife, two dogs, and who knows what else, but yes. <laughs> Do you think that the fun in it all and by saying in it all, because we all do look at these individual things like building the channel as a, as a, as a project in life and something that you've accomplished. But do you think the fun in it all is in the building? And do you think that's why even for, um, a channel owner, a channel host like yourself that has over a million subscribers and has almost ticked a huge life box with that, because that is, I know you see don't chase numbers, but we can stamp some numbers as a sign of success. And that sure. is a successful YouTube channel. For sure. So to, to see you get so excited today over a 50 person track walk event, mm -hmm. do you think the real fun in it all, in everything that we strive to achieve and want to do is actually in the building rather than in the build? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the same what you have with the project car. Like you, you never finish a project car because you are excited about it, working about it. And with everything... For me, it's about experiences, getting experience, also good and, and the bad ones. It's about life, learning something from it and going to a certain goal. And this is the excitement that we have now actually starting business because it's all brand new. It's a wind, like a fresh grasp of air or how you call it, whichever language you're going to, they're all identical idioms that you're going to say that this is like really refreshing, literally and figuratively. And absolutely. I love building new things. At least I came to realization that I like building new things. I like new challenges. Um, because in the past, I had different challenges to overcome in life, let's say, you know, without me thinking. I would say the biggest realization came to the fact that the big problem that I had as a kid and growing up and being an adult to a certain point I never thought that things would be possible for me to achieve. I never in a million years thought I could get a million subs on YouTube by making videos about some racetrack in the woods that how many people do care about cars? Yes, many. Yeah, maybe if you own them and people want to have some tangible piece of your success or whatever, uh, or experience that. But I never chased numbers because I never thought it was possible. I never thought I could start a business because it took me like forever to actually start a business. Although people just go out there and do it. You're 24 years old. You're like 10 years younger than me. And you're like already multiple business owner and you're just doing it. And that's what I take inspiration from, from many people that I actually gotten to know over the years. And like, they freaking do it. They just do it because. Stop talking. There's no business plan sometimes. And they just go. Exactly. Just go. And no offense because some people have achieved significantly more than I will ever achieve. And I respect them for the business decisions, but I think sometimes on their social skills, I'm like, how the hell did you manage to reach where you are in life? And it's because they have no constraints. They're not thinking like, oh, what is my mom going to think of me? Oh, but what if I cannot pay the bills? What if I cannot do it? They just go for it and they do it and they become successful because they are not thinking. And that is quite often like the biggest obstruction. It's not actually having the, the desire to do something, but being afraid of failure that holds you back. And there are so many people that talk you out of it. Every time that you would announce a business to this, you would be held back. And in my early days, it was by my mom. She would say like, why do you need this? Just go to school and get a regular nine to five job. Matarimats, his mom saying like, hey, don't, yeah, bring more people down with you because it's going to be the end. It's not going to end well. But it's the persistence and the ability to plow through no matter what setbacks you have, because at the end, the, the whichever end is going to be, whether it's a million subs or, or a million euro in your bank account or a million sales that you made of your product, it's not even the number that gives you the satisfaction, but all the obstructions and all the setbacks that you had in the back because that will make you feel like it's going to be significantly better. And same going back to me saying no together with Robert to actually taking over Apex. I will have, together with the rest of the team, a lot more pride into building something ourselves and overcoming all these issues. And the same issues that we overcame in the past when we were building Apex, because there were so many things that were like a brand new company came here and then started investing and having flashy cars and they were like out of the norm. We want to be disruptors and being out of the norm. And sometimes it's a 
big compliment when people say like, hey, that's not right, what you're doing. You're not normal. But life is too short to be normal and boring. So, And I want to thank you for coming on the podcast yet again as my first ever second guest for our Christmas special. But if you're listening to this away from Christmas, it's not the Christmas special. In your Christmas jumper and putting your faith in me as a host to have you on again. I'd also like to extend, as this is going out the weekend just before Christmas, a massive thank you to everybody that has tuned in to either Misha's episode today or any episode throughout the year. By doing so, you're helping this channel grow. We'll be able to get an array of guests, hopefully one day Mr. Rimac, on to share their stories. And if that helps everybody... You won't if you keep pronouncing his name wrong. (laughs) Rimac. 